Good morning. My name is Dimitrios Vavas and I will be talking about the basics of OCT imaging. This uh, information is uh, very well summarized in the chapter of Optical Coherence Tomography in Albert and Jacobiak last edition. There are several key points that I would uh, go through the, this presentation and I would like people to remember. OCT was first developed and described in Boston by Professor Fujimoto's group in 92 and first commercial OCT was available in 96, four years later. Spectral domain OCT has become the mainstream modality of retinal imaging and the swept source version of spectral domain OCT allows for wider depth of imaging and the ability to concurrently see in good detail structures from the vitreo retinal interface all the way to choroid. The different OCT machines, despite using the same technology, for example, spectral domain, have different segmentation algorithms and different normal thickness data, thus you cannot compare across machines. Most confused layers in the OCT are the outer nuclear layer and the handless layer, which are of similar reflectivity. Imaging of choroidal details necessitate enhanced depth imaging of, or the superior technology of swept source OCT. Software and fast reconstruction from cross-sectional cuts can help to map the extent of retinal pathologies such as geographic atrophy or loss of EZ line. All OCT systems distort the y-axis to elongate it and make it easier to see retinal pathology. The distortion is different in different machines. Dense raster or dense radial scan in OCT are best to detect small macular holes. In contrast to extracellular edema, intracellular edema results in increased reflectivity as seen in acute ischemic events. OCT is a static, not a dynamic view of the retina. Thus, in up to 10% of the cases, it can miss macular edema, whereas fluorescent and geography can easily detect it. Newer experimental modalities include true and fast OCT, full field OCT, which can be extremely fast in acquiring images, as well as polarization sensitive OCT, which can potentially give more information about the status of the retina structures. I would like again to highlight the, the contribution of Professor James Fujimoto in developing this groundbreaking technology from MIT. And uh, of course, for his work, he has been a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Professor Fujimoto, along with an ex Masaintier alumnus and uh, Professor Carmen Puliafito, along with uh, David Huang and Joel Schumann, they received the 2012 Antonio Sabalimot Vision Award for their role in developing OCT. This is award is considered the Nobel Prize in Ophthalmology. There are two main technologies in OCT, the original time domain OCT and the currently used Fourier transform or most commonly known as spectral domain OCT and the variety of spectral domain OCT called swept source OCT. Uh, the technical aspects of the OCT are briefly summarizing this uh, schematics here, and it is not the point of our lecture. It is just, uh, I would like people to remember that time domain uh, relies that the reflections at different, from different depths of the object generate interference signals at different times, and that's how we're able to reconstruct the image. For in spectral domain, a reflection at different depths generate interference signals with different frequencies, and then we use Fourier transform to know the depths. The swept source based, instead of using, relatively speaking, a broadband light source, the light source is usually very narrow, but for this purpose is considered broadband. In swept source, this, the light source is sweeping through various wavelengths over time, and that is uh, giving us the ability to go at uh, more depths and have uh, uh, better uh, depth of uh, imaging. And here is just another way to see these uh, schematics of the mechanics of OCT. These are some pictures of OCT. To the bottom right, we see the original first generation time domain, a Stratus OCT, which even at that time was considered you know, groundbreaking that we were able to see the retina at that detail. Of course, compare to the spectral domain, and we see, for example, top right in the spectralis or bottom left, it cannot compare. Uh, the, at that time, 
the OCTs were mostly shown in pseudo color. The different reflectivities had different color uh, assigned to them. But it is actually more informative than more recent uh, depiction of grayscale. These are some uh, technical information, which is also important to remember. Time domain was able to do 400 scans per second. Compare that to spectral domain, which is 27,000 to 70,000 scans per second, and the swept source, which goes all the way up to 400,000 scans per second. This allows much faster acquisition time, so ability to, to scan people with uh, poor attention span, difficulty in fixation, and um, uh, acquisition of uh, better images through averaging. We see that the light source in all these um, types of OCTs is in the infrared, which means that the scanning laser beam is not visible to the patient. The axial resolution and transverse resolution is different among the types of OCTs. The time domain had an axial resolution that means going from a different depth, 10 microns, versus transverse going along the line of, for example, RP, 20 microns. Contrast that to almost a two to uh, fold uh, increase in the axial resolution, five to seven in the spectral domain. Transverse can be as low as six microns. In the swept source, the axial resolution is even better, three to five microns. But the transverse resolution in small system is not that much better than the time domain at about 20 microns. Of course, the depth of imaging in the swept source is better, so we can see all the way from cortical vitreous to sclera. Whereas uh, in uh, spectral domain, we can see barely the posterior cortical vitreous. We can uh, go all the way to sclera with what is called enhanced depth imaging mode. Here is a spectral domain OCT, images that in high resolution acquisition mode that shows the different layers. We see the that fiber layers are usually hyper-reflective, like here, the inner fiber layer, and whereas nuclear layers are usually darker in reflectivity, less reflective. So here is a ganglion cell layer, here is the inner nuclear layer, here is the outer plexiform layer. We confuse easily because of very similar reflectivity the Henry's layers and the outer nuclear layer. And a lot of people call both of them as outer nuclear layer, that is incorrect. As we can see here in blue, the outer nuclear layer, and in orange, the Henry's layer in panel A. After the nuclear layer, the first uh, reflective line is the external limiting membrane. Then we have the inner segment myoid zone. Then we have the ellipsoid zone as the first reflective layer. Then the outer segments. Then the interdigitating zone. Then the RP and then the Brooks membrane. If we look uh, in higher resolution at these outer bright lines, uh, we see them here in panel B, the external limiting membrane, the inner segment myoid zone, the, uh, the ellipsoid zone, and the outer segments, then the interdigitating zone as a bright line, then the RPE, and then the Brooks membrane. And the Brooks membrane and the RPE can, very, it can be very difficult to distinguish. Go to panel C. We're going to see that um, the choroid has the chorio capillaris, then the medium uh, size vessels, the subtler layer, and then the larger vessels, the hollow layer. This can be very different in thickness and the ability to distinguish them among patients. In panel D, we have a even higher resolution of what was shown in the panel B, just to show that there's mu much more information if we acquire higher resolution. In here we see all spectral domain of the same patient, same eye, just how it appears at different machines. Top left is Heidelberg, top right is OptoView, bottom left is Zeiss Cirrus 5000, and bottom right is the plexi lit swept source, which is not uh, widely available and is still mostly in experimental mode in academic centers, although it is approved for certain things for clinical practice. We see how much different kind of information we gain from different machines. 
because the different machines change what is called the gamma gain, how it, uh, it, it, uh, it shows high and low reflectivity so you can highlight different things. Also the different machines generate different types of thickness maps because the segmentation is a little bit different. And some machines have normative data that they can compare against and some machines don't. The specialist doesn't have normative data to compare against. So this gives you a map with uh, different uh, values and different you know, color uh, coding. Uh, because of where the um, segmentation is placed, as you see here on the same patient, uh, the spectralis Heidelberg gives a higher total value of thickness than the Xi series in panel B. So the central uh, macular thickness is 274 in the Heidelberg spectralis, and for the same patient, we have a value of 260 in the series. In uh, OptoView, the same patient gives us a 263, and the Plex Elite just generates a, a volume map without giving us detailed uh, numbers. Here again, we compare four commonly used uh, machines, the different scan speeds, the scan depth, as we see the OptoView Avanti and the Plex Elite, the effectively soft source, have like three millimeters of scan depth versus the other ones are usually about two millimeters. The actual resolution is about five micrometers and digitally the Plex Elite they can go all the way down to two micrometers. The transverse resolution, the best one is the Heidelberg Spectralis, 5.7 micrometers. The others are at about 15 micrometers. Here I would like to highlight the difference in ONL and Hennes layer and how sometimes people can be confused when they do not know that these two layers have similar reflectivity. Because if the patient is a little bit tilted compared to the imaging axis, the hands there can be visible in part of the image. As we see here on the top panel, we see this eye is tilted and we see that the hands layer on the left side, the, mic, the temporal region of the, is more reflective, the hair shown in black, than in the nasal part of the macula. And we see with blue highlighting the thickness of the outer nuclear layer and with orange the hands layer. And here we see in the Heidelberg again the same thing. Uh, this is barely seen if the eye is vertically, but if the eye is tilted, now we can see the hands layer more prominent in the Heidelberg machine. Sometimes this can confuse people if the patient is complaining for something else. People may see this and they may think that this is something abnormal to explain the symptoms when well, this is just a normal thing. In the bottom panel here, I also would like to highlight that uh, what is most often called the RPE Brooks membrane in high resolution acquisition of a spectral domain, I can actually appreciate four different lines. The interdigitation zone, which has two different ones, the cone and the rods, if you could go to an area that has both cones and rods, and then there's the line of the RP, and then there is a Brooks membrane, and here it is in higher magnification just to appreciate these structures that can easily confuse people if they think it's one. So it is actually there's more information hidden in there if we go in high resolution. Uh, there is another um, technique that was. Um, uh, figured out in, in the history of a special domain. If we focus a little bit deeper, the image is inverted, as we see here on the top panel, and now we can see a little bit more the information of the choroid. This is called um, half depth imaging. Nowadays, the companies have included a protocol that when you go for a half depth imaging, it inverts back to the uh, um, uh, orientation that we are accustomed. But in reality, when we first acquire the image, it is inverted, and then the software reinverts it so it looks to our eyes the same way. Having multiple B scans, one can make then an fast reconstruction image, and then we can go at different depths, like superficial retina, mid retina, and uh, deep retina colloid, and we get information, for example, of geographic atrophy, occlusion, etc. This is used mostly experimentally in academic institutions. However, true and fast acquisition exists in experimental mode and has advantage because you flood the whole object with a light, we can, you can acquire the image much faster. 
the top right panel panel B as it's called there, it shows to you the difference in, 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 in the way the image is acquired in a transverse uh, acquisition and fast, truly and fast. You just go the whole thing and just go different depths, like you know, inner retina, middle retina, and the bottom retina. Whereas in in classical uh, OCT, you make transverse sections. Um, the problem with uh, a fast acquisition CD, although it is faster, the resolution is less. However, people are working in techniques uh, to increase the resolution of uh, full field acquisition CD here in E. This is their technology, DM on, as they call it. And you can see that it can become quite uh, good resolution. This is in an this I put it here just to show that there are people working on trying to understand if polarization information can be useful to us, but this is still experimental. Uh, in these slides, I would like to now move to the fact that the y-axis is always distorted. So the y and the x-axis are not on the same scale. So this axis, the y-axis, is different than the x-axis. The y-axis is elongated. This is how they usually present it, but this is how actually the image is. And we can appreciate it here with the infrared fundus image. And you can see that we get different type of information in our brain when we look at the two images down here or below, had the same x, y scaling versus a distorted image on top. Here we see a patient post open globe injury, the optus fundus image. We see some hemorrhages. And the um, patient complained that his vision has dropped. We do an OCT, and here we see that there is some, you know, uh, uh, trauma to the retina tissues, but uh, it appears to be intact otherwise. However, if we continue to take images, we're going to see that there is actually a hole. So, why am I putting this case here? Is to highlight that a single cut can fool us. A single cut by people being presenting up in podiums can fool and hide the information. And to detect holes, you really need dense radial or dense raster scans. You want to see all of the scans to determine if there's a hole or not. Other artifacts that can happen on OCT is because of noise and reflectivity changes or media opacities, the segmentations can be wrong. Uh, if the image is outside of these two millimeters that the uh, OCT can image, they are inverted and they are out of the image. If there is in C meters opacities, they can shadow. Uh, here we see some now pathology. On the panel A, we see vitreomacular traction. Uh, there is no PVD here. The vitreous is still adhering to the optic nerve. There's just a, you know, a partial separation and traction. Here is the premacular bursa. Still, and this is the posterior hyaluric pulling up on the retina. Here is again, there is no PVD, there is no PVD here, and it's pulling on the retina and it has a full thickness macular hole with an operculum still attached. Here is on C, we see that the operculum is off, but there is no PVD. You see that the posterior hyaluric is attached by the optic nerve. On uh, panel A, we see uh, an epiretinal membrane with a lot of thickening and macular edema. In panel B, we see something that is called epiretinal proliferation. It has this bright medium reflectivity and bright reflectivity again. It has this medium reflectivity in the retina. This is called epiretinal proliferation. It has a different prognosis, uh, worse outcomes on peeling. It is important to differentiate. In panel C and D, we see MACTEL. We see here that we see these cavitations. We do see a foveal depression, but that doesn't mean that there is no macular edema. There is macular edema as we see the leakage and flush angiography. And the same thing in panel D, which is the same the other eye or the, the left eye of the same patient in panel C. Here again we see that the OCD cannot always pick up the edema. Here is on top um, the structural OCT of a patient that uh, clearly on fluorescent geography has leakage. Please remember that the OCT is static, so it misses 10% of leakage. If you suspect leakage, get an FA when the OCT doesn't show it. 
here is molecular degeneration, intrusion on panel A, intrusion with suprenal to isonality policy panel B, and wet AMD with no vascularization on the RPE, cystic edema in retinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and isonality babies. Here is we in panel D, uh, you know, uh, CNV in AMD with minimal SRF, subretinal fluid. And here, the city can actually show the choroidal vessels growing into this, what we call vascularized PAT. In panel E, is an end stage of what MD called disky from scar. In the uh, left panel, is a type 1 CNV, before and one month after anti VGF. Uh, type 1 means under the RPE. In the uh, middle panel, is type 3, it's a CNV that starts within the retina. And we see the ICG and geography on top, and then we see the OCT image, and we see that the RPE is intact here. Of course, you need multiple cuts to make sure that in other cuts you don't see a problem breaking the RPE. Eventually, type 3 can connect with the choroid, and can be co it's called retinochoroidal anastomosis. In the right panel, we have a PCV, polypoidal polyvascularity. We see the hemorrhages, and we see the polyps and, and geography. Here we see something that is called domed maculopathy in high myopia. We see this is the sclera. This thing here is the sclera. sclera and the choroid is very, very thin. In high myopia, the choroid is very thin. Here is like, you know, 5, 10 microns, 20 microns. Very, very thin. In normal is about 250 microns. But this is the choroid. This is here orbital fat. Here is the nocity of um, macroaneurysm. And we see the blood and the shadowing under the retina and then in further away we just see basically fluid down here and then this guy. Here we see the nevus and the melanoma and uh, we see how it is fusiform and we see the thickness. Here is just a flat nevus, very small. Here we see um, before and after, a uh, patient uh, got a uh, retinal artery occlusion. So we see the thick map here, the thickness. We see that the inner retina is reflective. It is thick in compared before. This hypertransmission is not hypertransmission, it is fooling us uh, as a hypertransmission. It's because we have shadowing from the areas of high reflectivity. This is normal reflectivity here in the phobia because the phobia gets its oxygen from the choroid, so it doesn't become ischemic. And not just the phobia, actually all the photoreceptors, the outer one third of the retina, gets the oxy its oxygen from the choroid. So the inner two thirds of the retina, the ganglion cells, inner plexiform, you know, bipolars, that they are ischemic, not the photoreceptors, and they get swollen up. But in the foveola, there's no inner retina, it's only outer retina, and that's why it is normal. Here is a patient that uh, has a Eventually, thinning of that retina died um, after some time. And uh, here it is, we see that hole, it's called the Pratsen retinal occlusion, the whole superior retina is thin. And that thinning is uh, basically loss of tissue. Here's another example of fibrovascular uh, PED, and it's showing nicely here this hyperreflective vessel. The vessel is called hyperreflective. Interestingly, the vessels on the retina in the CT are hyperreflective, but the vessels in the choroid appear hyperreflective. Here's another one, which is a bit pigmented, that shows that you don't need OCTA all the time. Panel C here on the top left is a central serous retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy in D, irvine gas, cystoid macular edema in E. Vein occlusion with ERM and macular edema in F. And the bottom two appear normal, but uh, bottom left is uh, diabetic retinopathy with edema that has been missed. And bottom right is telangiectatic changes with a leakage that the uh, OCT missed. Here is another patient with MACOFRD repair or U. Now complaints of recent decreased vision in the D. 2070 in the right eye, 2050 in the left. The right eye was better before. 
Uh, and we look at the OCT, the OCTs look the same. If anything, the OCT in the left looks a little bit warmer color thicker. But if we do a fluorescent geography of the, uh, we will see here in the right eye that there is clear leakage by the macula and that the OCT missed, whereas the left eye did not have that leakage. So the patient uh, complaint of the right eye was specific to CME. Here is some OCTs of uh, a wide uh, uh, field viewing. Sometimes it's done with stitching, sometimes some machines do have the ability to go wide. On top left we see a detachment. On top right we see a retina schisis. Bottom we see pathology myopia findings. Here's a patient with staphylomas and we see again a very, very thin choroid, thick sclera, lobular fat and ciliary vessels. We see that um, Pathologic myopia, it can be difficult to find the fovea. The shape of the posterior pole can be quite varied, can have steps, can have irregular staphylomas. Here is a VKH disease with a septa. This is it's considered classic for that. This uh, top panel is before and after treatment top right. And uh, bottom B is magnification. So I would like to summarize that OCT was first developed and described in Boston by Professor Fujimoto. In 92, four years later, it was the first commercially available. The spectral domain OCT has become the mainstream modality. Different OCT machines, despite using the same technology, have different segmentation algorithms and different normal thickness data. Most confused layers are the outer nuclear layers and the hemis layer, which are of similar reflectivity. Imaging of the corrected tails necessitate enhanced depth imaging or the superior swept source OCD. Software and fast reconstruction from cross-sectional cuts can help to map the extent of fentanyl pathologies, such as geographic artery and loss of easy line. All OCT systems distort the y-axis, they elongate the y-axis. And the distortion is different in different machines. We, if you want to see if a hole is closed or small holes, you do need dense raster or dense radial scans in OCT and you want to review all of them. In contrast to extracellular edema, intracellular edema results in increased reflectivity as in deep ischemic events. OCT is a static, not a dynamic view of the retina. Thus, in up to 10% of the cases, it can miss macular edema, whereas fluorescent geography can easily detect it. Newer experimental modalities include true and fast OCT, which can be extremely fast in acquiring images. I would like to thank you very much for your attention.